London, autumn 1928. A bacteriologist has returned from holiday to find mouldy petri dishes on his lab bench. And when he looks closely, he can see that the mould has stopped the growth of the bacteria surrounding it. The messy lab, of course, belonged to Alexander Fleming, and this accident led to the discovery of penicillin. It's no exaggeration to say Fleming's discovery revolutionised medicine. With antibiotics, human life expectancy has increased by 20 years. But even Fleming knew that antibiotics might not always be able to save us. When he won the Nobel Prize in 1945, he warned that one day they could stop working. And now that danger is looming. Antibiotic resistance is now one of the biggest threats to global health. At least 10 million could die every year if we don't get on top of this. Like climate change, we humans are doing it to ourselves, but it could kill us before climate change does. Scientists know we have to find alternatives to antibiotics. New treatments are on the horizon, but it's a race against time. You're listening to Stories of Our Times from The Times and The Sunday Times. I'm Jenny Kleeman. Today, what happens when the antibiotics don't work? I'm Ben Spencer. I'm science editor of The Sunday Times. Tell us, Ben, why does resistance to antibiotics matter? So antibiotics we use all the time. If we have an infection, say tonsillitis, if you have a hip operation, you'll take antibiotics to ward off any bacteria getting into the wound when you're opened up, say a cesarean section, having your tonsils out. So we use antibiotics all the time. And over time, bacteria becomes resistant. So it's what we call antibiotic resistance or antimicrobial resistance. People might have heard of superbugs. Superbugs are a symptom of antibiotic resistance. Things like MRSA or C. difficile, very hard to treat because they've evolved to escape antibiotics. Do you mean then that if antibiotics don't work, if the bacteria have evolved to escape them, then routine procedures having a caesarean, having a hip replacement, are not going to be possible or will be really dangerous? There will be dangerous. There was a time when if you were doing an operation where you cut into someone's skin, the risk of infection was high. That all changed in the 1920s when Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. Suddenly we had a drug which could defeat bacterial infections. And by the 1940s, they were widespread. But that's now changing again because we have this developing resistance. Bacteria are evolving to resist our weapons against them, essentially. How much of a problem is all of this right now, at the moment? So it's creeping up. Probably about 10 years ago, there was a lot of interest in antibiotic resistance. The then chief medical officer, Dame Sally Davis, was very, very aware of the problem. She made it her real, her cause while she was in office. And if we don't take action, then what we're going to see is the end of modern medicine. This is truly a global fight and we all have a role to play. And the then Prime Minister, David Cameron, commissioned a review um, there are a series of reports published into antibiotic resistance. I went to the launch and publication of most of those, sat through these increasingly dire warnings about what this would do to our health service. Medicine was going to be taken back to the Middle Ages, and then it was going to be taken back to the Dark Ages. And, you know, we will not be able to do standard operations anymore and the rhetoric was piling and piling and piling up and then it kind of went away people kind of forgot about it and nothing really was done I mean part of the problem with antibiotic resistance is there's been no new antibiotics for years so there's no way to kind of 
get ahead of the game in this kind of war with bacteria. And then you kind of thought, well, was it all a bit hyperbolic? Um, there were these figures thrown around, like 10 million people would die of antibiotic resistance by 2050. And I had never spoken to anyone who had, you know, died of antibiotic resistance. I mean, you'd always have outbreaks of MRSA and C. difficile in hospitals, but that seemed quite distant from this kind of dystopian future where drugs didn't work anymore. But then last year, there was a report in The Lancet. A new report in The Lancet shows that drug-resistant bacterial infections killed more than 1.2 million people in 2019. That's more than HIV or malaria in the same year. And that was a big wake-up moment. We just suddenly realised this dystopian future has kind of crept up on us. And since then, I've spoken to you know, several people who are actually affected by this. It's mostly people who have to take antibiotics a lot, people with chronic diseases such as cystic fibrosis or chronic urinary tract infections. They are affected because the number of drugs which we can treat them with is growing smaller. I know that you spoke to one person in particular who's living with cystic fibrosis. Tell us about her. So this is a lady called Abigail Halstead. She lives in Cambridgeshire. She's 32 years old and she has three kids. And she has cystic fibrosis, which is a chronic condition. It's essentially a respiratory condition, but it leaves her extremely vulnerable to infection. She has a horrible bacteria which colonises her body. And every so often, she has a recurrence and she has to go into hospital for a couple of weeks. And this happens maybe every eight weeks, maybe every 12 weeks if she's lucky. And she gets very, very ill. And the doctors just chuck antibiotics at her. But they're beginning not to work anymore. And so they have to try different antibiotics, but the number of antibiotics that they can try is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So she's in this really kind of precarious position and she's running out of time. She's running out of treatments. That is just terrifying. And of course, not just for her, but for her family as well. She's a young yeah. woman. She's got three small children. That must be absolutely terrifying for all of them. But then tell us then, Ben, how come we're in this place? Why is this happening? How did we get to this point? Well, antibiotics we've been using for 100 years, and they're brilliant. You know, they're a wonder drug, essentially. They completely changed modern medicine. And we've used too much of them, essentially. Every time someone goes to the doctor with, say, a chest infection and says, give me some antibiotics... More often than not, that will be caused by a virus. Now, antibiotics don't work against viruses. They work against bacterial infections. But quite often, there's a pressure on a GP to give out something. But this is happening all the time. Mm. And we overuse antibiotics. And we overuse them in this country, even though there's been, I don't know, 10 years pushback against this. GPs are told all the time to use fewer antibiotics and they're monitored on it. So we're, we're amongst the best in the world at this and not giving out antibiotics and we're still giving out too many. In other countries, if you go to, say, India, you can get antibiotics from a pharmacist without a prescription. If you go to the US, it's very easy. So globally, we're using too much and that's before we get on to to animal health you know antibiotics are massively used in farming to try and stop infections and basically animals are pumped full of the things so for all the times that I might have soldiered on with a sore throat and thought no I'm not going to go to the GP it almost is a drop in the ocean isn't it if you've got other countries giving them yeah. out without prescription and animals being dosed up with antibiotics who aren't even sick. They're, they're giving them prophylactically, aren't they, to kind of stop them from getting ill. So the problem is overuse, but it's also that no new antibiotics have, have been developed for a long time. 
Yeah, that's right. No new class of antibiotics has been developed since the 80s. And it costs a lot of money to develop drugs. Say it costs a billion pounds to develop a new antibiotic. I think that's roughly the figure that's been thrown around. You need to sell a hell of a lot of drugs to recoup that. But if and when a new antibiotic class is developed, they will be under pressure not to prescribe it, to keep that as a kind of antibiotic of last resort. So how does that work? So a lot of economists have kind of scratched their heads and come up with models to incentivize the development of new antibiotics, but nothing's worked so far. This all sounds pretty bleak, Ben, and terrifying. Is it a hopeless situation? So the situation is worrying, but it's not without hope. Scientists have been thinking about this for a long time. There's a lot of resources now going into new approaches. And there's one particular approach, which isn't actually a new approach, which is particularly exciting. So this is phage therapy, which stands for bacteriophages. And these are viruses. These are viruses which kill bacteria. Now, we all think of viruses as something to be feared. We've all just lived through a pretty horrific pandemic where the virus was the enemy. But there are actually viruses which can be useful. And phages are a particular type of these. And there are loads of them. For every type of bacteria, there's about 10 phages 10 different types of phages which purely exist to defeat that bacteria. And we didn't know anything about this, but about 100 years ago, in the 1920s, they were discovered. And the world was very excited about them. They were seen as a miracle cure, a new wonder drug. And then within 10 years, we kind of forgot about them because antibiotics appeared. But now that antibiotics we're beginning to really see the limitations. There's a turning back to phages and doctors beginning to think, can we use these good viruses to treat bacterial infections? That's so interesting then, that phages were discovered around the same time as antibiotics, but we ran away with the idea of antibiotics and kind of ignored them a bit. Essentially, yeah. And how do phages work? I mean, if you could design anything to kill bacteria, you would come up with phages. They're just highly, highly specific, highly evolved killing machines, and they're killing bacteria. And what they do is they kind of, they look like these kind of, I don't know, like a moon lander. They've got this head, which has all the genetic material in, and then they've got these legs, which land on... A bacteria and then they've got this tail which spikes itself into the bacteria and hooks on and then inserts its genes into the bacteria and they basically once they're inside the bacteria they take over its genes replicate itself and then explode the bacterium from the inside out and the amazing thing about it is even while we're talking this process is happening like even in the last five or six words i've said this process has happened within my body probably a thousand times, a million times. So it's a very, very effective way of killing bacteria, but it's very specific. Most phages will only latch on to one type of bacteria or even a subtype, a strain of bacteria. So you can't just chuck any old phage at any old infection. You have to match them up. So how do you find those phages? Where can they be found, apart from inside our bodies? I mean, they're everywhere. They're in water, they're in the air, they're in the soil. There was a study recently which found that there are 800 different phages just on the leaves of wheat. I mean, it's just incredible, right? So we know... We've identified, science has identified, a tiny, tiny proportion of all the phages out there. There was a scientist I know at Exeter University, during the pandemic, he went out with his son and put a glass into the stream behind their house in Exeter. 
and fished out just a jar of water from the stream. And they found a phage which can defeat one of the most resistant bacterium that exists. So, you know, you can just do it anywhere. People are using phage therapy right now, aren't they? And and you've spoken to some of them. Yeah. When I say we forgot about them 100 years ago, we did in the West. But in the Soviet Union, they were continued to be used basically ever since. Because during the Cold War, there wasn't a great supply of antibiotics to the USSR. So phage therapy continued to be used. And Georgia, which is a former Soviet country, is kind of the leading country for phage research. And you go to Georgia and you can go into a pharmacist and get a vial of phage therapy or an ointment. And there's clinics where you can go for more specialised phages where you can have them on a drip for really seriously ill people. But yeah, in the West, we view it as kind of very old fashioned. You know, doctors are slightly suspicious of it. There haven't been great clinical trials and the regulation isn't up to scratch. So in Britain, only 13 people have been treated with phages in the last kind of 15 years. So the patients that I've spoken to have used it have actually travelled to Georgia to get it. Tell me about some of those patients. Well, there's a guy called Simon Jones who lives in Coventry. He's 50 years old and he has a pretty nasty condition called prostatitis. It's a urinary tract infection which has got into his prostate. And it's very unpleasant and very hard to shift. And he's been on antibiotics for quite a few years and it doesn't really work. And because he has to take antibiotics all the time, it's made him quite ill. So he went to Georgia to a clinic where they identified the bacteria that colonised his prostate and they matched it to a phage in their library. So they've got these vast libraries of different phages and they match it to one which they thought would work. How, how is the treatment administered? How does he receive the phages? It's a kind of a drink. It's like a shot. And he says it kind of tastes a bit like seawater, not unpleasant, but just kind of not particularly nice. But, you know, he just takes that twice a day. Was the treatment effective then? Initially, yes. For three years, it was completely clear. He's since come back twice, so he's just finished another bout of phage treatment. So it's not been a cure for him, but he says it was far, far better than the actual antibiotics. But he spent a lot of money. He spent about £10,000 in all getting this and with all the travel and everything. So it's not cheap. It's not cheap, but it was successful enough to be worth it for him. Yeah. However, there's a lot of ineffective phages sold. So I wouldn't recommend that people just go onto the internet and buy this stuff because you don't know what you're taking. But taken correctly, the specific appropriate phage is a possible treatment for Abigail, the cystic fibrosis patient who you spoke about earlier. Yeah, Abigail, it's really her only hope. So there's a team of doctors at Yale University in the US who are currently assessing some samples that Abigail sent them. And they're going through these vast libraries and trying to match up her samples with a phage which can defeat the particular bacteria she has. Ben, you've mentioned these libraries in the US and in Georgia, but we don't have equivalent libraries here yet, do we? How close are we to having that kind of information and to rolling out the use of phage therapy more widely in the UK? Well, we're starting. We're at the beginning of a journey which could end up with this becoming quite common. Leicester University has just set up a centre for phage research, which is a big step. And their plan is to have a phage library. The House of Commons Science and Technology Select Committee is 
just in the process of doing an inquiry into phage therapy and the hurdles that are currently stopping phage therapy being used in the UK. There are some big hurdles, though. One, and this is pretty crucial, at the moment, the only way to get phage therapy into the UK is for compassionate use. And that basically means people who have no other options. They're basically at the end of their life, nothing else is working. And in that situation, you've got to persuade a hospital elsewhere or a group of scientists to find your phage, ship it in. You've got to find a doctor in the UK who's happy to use it, but it's not licensed in this country. And where do we stand when it comes to regulation in this country? Do we have a framework for for using phages safely? Not really, not at the moment. They're complicated things. You know, for every infection, you essentially need a completely customised virus to treat with. And our health system just isn't set up for that. Our entire pharmaceutical system is set up for using drugs. It's not set up for using live viruses. And there's these standards called GMP, which stand for Good Manufacturing Practice. And basically to isolate and manufacture a phage for one patient under this Good Manufacturing Practice standards would cost about a million pounds per patient. So it's just not achievable right at the moment. So it needs a complete rethink. And when I say it needs a complete rethink, this isn't just this area of medicine for which we need this rethink. Medicine is changing. There was a time when you used these broad brush treatments, like sledgehammers. So you'd have a broad spectrum antibiotic. Anyone with an infection, you'd give a type of penicillin. Anyone with cancer, you give chemotherapy. Mm. We're not there anymore. You've got highly specific immunotherapies, you've got genetic medicine, you've got gene editing, and medicine is becoming more and more specific and more and more personalised, which is great. It means fewer side effects, it means more effective treatments, but it also means that our regulatory system is going to have to change. We can't have a situation where every treatment is individually licensed and regulated because essentially you'd be regulating every patient. So it's it's as if the issue is not phage therapy, the issue is a regulatory system designed for another age. Exactly. Would you be prepared to hazard a guess how far into the future phages might be able to come to the rescue? I'd hope that within five years we'd be treating more patients. There's a trial in Scotland for using phage therapy for diabetic foot ulcers. I mean, this is the way medicine works, right? You trial it on a area as a pilot and then you roll it out. So I'd say, I'd hope within five years we'll be a lot further along than we are now. In 10 years, it might be much more widespread than that. In theory, then, it could be in use soon enough to help the people you spoke to, people like Abigail, the mother of three with cystic fibrosis. Yeah, I'd hope so. I'd hope so. You've been listening to Stories of Our Times, a podcast brought to you thanks to subscribers of The Times and The Sunday Times with me, Jenny Kleeman, and my guest, Sunday Times science editor, Ben Spencer. And Ben has taken a deep dive into all of this in The Sunday Times magazine, which you can read on The Times website. You can find all of Ben's reporting there at thetimes.co.uk or in print on Sundays. The producers were Blanca Schofield and Taryn Siegel. The executive producers today were Kate Ford and James Shield, and sound design was by Hannah Varrell. Have a great weekend.